We've already covered all of the essential tags that you're going to put into the content of your web pages, that is in the bodies, but here are four more that are pretty essential to know, except these all go in the header. First, there's style, which we've already covered, which is really just about including CSS rules. And then there's the script tag, which is for including JavaScript code. And there's the link tag, which is for linking in related resources, uh, which is sort of a generic catch-all. Uh, we'll discuss in a moment. And meta, meta tags are simply meta information about the page. The most common use of the meta tag is to throw in extra information in the page so that search engines like Google can see what the keywords of the page are. For example, looking back at the source code of the New York Times page we saw, you'll see in the first half of the header here there's a good number of meta tags including one with an attribute name equals keywords and an attribute content equals politics and government, Manhattan, Christians and Christianity, Muslim Americans, Tea Party movement, demonstrations, etc., etc., etc. Those are all just keywords which are intended for search engines like Google. So when Google crawls the New York Times website and encounters this page, it can get some idea of what this page concerns. That, anyway, is the most common use of meta tags. There are a few other uses we won't get into. The most common use of the link tag is to link in style sheets, that is, files of CSS rules. Because you can include CSS rules, as I showed you already, with the style tag put inside the header of your page. But more commonly, if you have a whole bunch of CSS, you're going to split that off into some separate file, which you would probably name something like site.css, and you'd place it somewhere on your web server, and then using the link tag, link to it so that when your web page is downloaded the user's web browser also knows to request this file of CSS rules which it then applies to the same page. So here in this example the link tag has an attribute rel which stands for relationship as in the relationship what kind of relationship this linked resource has to the page in which the link tag is included. In this case the linked resource is a style sheet and then the type specifies, again, that this is CSS, and href, uh, again, hypertext reference, that's simply the URL of the resource, in this case, the file of CSS rules. Now, you may object here that this URL, site.css, doesn't look like a normal URL. Well, what's going on here is that this is a relative URL rather than an absolute URL. An absolute URL, like an absolute file path, is fully written out, like we expect. But a relative URL, like a relative file path, is incomplete, and the full URL, the absolute URL, is uh, inferred from context. And the way that works is when you see a relative URL in a web page, like say in a link tag, the browser takes the absolute URL of the page itself, hacks off the part after the last slash, and then appends the relative URL. So, for example, if our browser downloads the page example.com slash stuff slash junk slash thing.html and in that page there's a relative URL that just reads site.css, then the way the browser interprets that is as a URL pointing to example example.com slash stuff slash junk slash site.css. Now, the thing to keep in mind here is that though URLs superficially resemble file paths, they really aren't, because on the web server here, there's not necessarily any directory called stuff inside which is any directory called junk. There's no necessary requirement for that to be the case at all. You know, what the URL means is entirely up to interpretation by the web server. However, it's very common in websites to somewhat imitate that directory structure when it comes to designing the structure of URLs for the site. So relative URLs are often quite useful. And in fact, you can also use dot dot in your relative URLs, and it works very much like with relative file paths. So if we're on the page example.com slash stuff slash junk slash thing dot html, and we have a relative URL on that page that reads dot dot slash site dot CSS, then the browser interprets that as not hacking off everything after the last slash, but hacking off everything um, after the second to last slash. So we end up with example.com slash stuff slash site dot CSS. Again, this is a superficial imitation of relative file paths and absolute file paths, but 
just remember that the similarities end there. A form in a web page refers to any combination of text boxes, check boxes, radio buttons, uh, pull down menus, etc. The idea of web forms is that the user is prompted to fill out certain information, like fill in text boxes, and once they've done so, they then hit the submit button. That submit button is like a link to a URL with the difference that the information filled out by the user in the form gets tacked on somehow, either in the form of a post request or uh, in a normal GET request with all that information appended as GET parameters. GET parameters, if you remember, mean take a URL and then at the end you tack on a question mark followed by key value pairs, name value pairs separated by ampersands. Those are GET parameters. So here, for example, we have a form tag and in the form tag we specify the action meaning the URL which the data is submitted to when the user hits the submit button. And the method attribute specifies how we're going to send that data. Is this going to be a post or a get request? If it says post, then the data is sent in the body of a post request to the URL, which here is the relative URL page.html. The content of a form can be anything you like, but the actual form elements, the things which have the data which we're going to send, those are called inputs. So we have input tags, and for each input we specify what kind of input it is. Uh, text here means that it's a text box, checkbox means it's a checkbox obviously, and type submit means that it's the submit button, which by default just has the text submit query, though you can customize that. It doesn't have to read submit query, you can have the button say something else. So the key thing to understand here is that the form tag itself is not really like a visual element. It's just a logical container for a set of inputs. And when you submit the form, all of the data entered into those inputs in the form are what gets sent. You might have a separate form on the same page, but those two forms are separate. The inputs in one have nothing to do with the other form. In any case, you can see in the example I've written as the user of the web page, I've written hello. And if I were to click on the submit query button, then that would send a post request to the URL page.html. And the body of that post request would include two values. You would see Bob equals hello and Carol equals blank because I didn't check the checkbox. If I had checked the checkbox, it would have the default value Carol equals on. In any case, forms are the primary means by which data entered by the user on a web page can be sent to the web server. Finally, we have two last notable tags. There's the object element for embedding plugin elements, most notably flash elements. And then the iframe tag, I here standing for inline, as an inline frame, refers to an element which itself is a separate HTML document, something which is requested as a separate document, but then displayed as an element within some other page. The use of iframes is somewhat frowned upon. It's certainly something that can be easily abused. For example, iframes are what you see when you get pop-ups, but in a few contexts, they are genuinely useful. So we're not going to say anything in detail about objects or airframes, so there's something you may wish to read up on. And that concludes our coverage of HTML and CSS. In the supplement for this unit, I'll add some coverage of some stuff we glossed over a bit too much, like say some of the more advanced CSS selectors. So now that we've covered JavaScript in itself as a programming language, and also now as HTML and CSS, in the next unit, we can talk about the combination of the two, how to use JavaScript in our web pages.